a couple of quick slides of what I think this GPT transition might look like. And when you're thinking your century, your half century, or even generation into the future, you should be realizing that some of these things are probably going to have to be part of your plans. So if we're looking at coping with carbon, dealing with our climate change problem, getting, getting us down to zero carbon, one of the first things that's going to, happen to have to happen is we're going to have to start paying a price for using the atmosphere as dump, garbage dump for our carbon dioxide. So, you know, we're going to have to have a carbon price of some kind, so many dollars per ton. Probably going to make it really an incentive for people to change. It's going to be have, have to be at least $50 per ton of emitted carbon dioxide. And that's a government policy that will have to be introduced. Of course, this government currently is completely opposed to it at the federal level, but it will probably happen as we start to see more and more obvious evidence that the global climate is causing us trouble. And if we have a carbon price, then a whole bunch of things become possible. This is what I call my 30-30-40 uh, plan for dealing with our energy problem and carbon problem. 30% we can probably achieve through efficiency and conservation. 30% through renewables, such as uh, solar and wind, especially distributed solar panels on housetops, uh, small wind farms and things like ground source heat pumps, which is a technology that's underused, it's something you may have heard about. And then we'll have a 40% need for the remainder of our energy, which will be distributed by large-scale, capital-intensive, grid-distributed power plants, electrical power plants, probably, at least initially, natural gas or coal, where you take that carbon dioxide that's produced and pump it underground with a technology called carbon capture and storage or nuclear power. But this will be transitional, this here. And eventually we're going to move to new zero carbon energy technologies, and I would say by the middle of the century we'll see some of these out, moved out to very large scale. And my, the one that I think is particularly interesting is enhanced geothermal, which is where you, do, you drill deep into the ground. You go down about, say, 10 kilometers, and you fracture the rock, you push water down there, and make it very hot to about 300 degrees, bring it up to the surface and use it to drive turbines. And that's a technology that has a very high power density and can potentially be used anywhere in the world. So, we can do this. It's, this is feasible. The challenge at this point is getting the incentives in place in the form of a carbon price, and the deeper challenge is making sure we have the political will to make those changes, to challenge the vested interests in our economy that are trying to block that particular change. And then let's go and look at the, at the issue of coping with oil scarcity. The, the oil problem that we face is really a liquid fuel transportation, transportation fuel problem. Oil prices are going to rise above $100 a barrel as the global economy recovers, and eventually these prices are going to go high enough, and the level is probably around $170 per barrel. Where, where's the break point? It will go high enough that it causes demand destruction. People will say, I don't want to pay for this oil anymore, I'm going to look for something else. Now it turns out that we can currently deliver power to the wheel of a car, to the tire of a car, uh, at a fifth of the cost with electricity compared to gasoline or diesel. So it's already a lot cheaper to drive your vehicle with electricity than it is with gasoline or diesel. The problem with electrical transportation is range. But that's something that I imagine will be addressed in a whole variety of ways. We can talk about that if you wish. And when it is addressed, and when the price goes high enough for oil, I think you're going to see a reconfiguration of our transportation system really fast from a gasoline and diesel-driven transportation to an electrical transportation system. If you take photographs of downtown Toronto or downtown Waterloo, well, maybe not Waterloo, let's say Toronto, because I don't know how big Waterloo was back in 18. I'm not even sure it was called Waterloo. Was it in Berlin or something? Maybe that's a kitchen. Anyway, let's get out of the history of this area. Let's look at Toronto. So you take a photograph of downtown Toronto in 1890, and you compare it with the photograph of the same street in 1905 or 1910. It's the same buildings, but the street looks entirely different. The horses have disappeared. It happened really fast. When the internal combustion engine was introduced and the economics were right, the flip, the technological flip in the transportation system occurred within a period of about 15 years. And I would guess we're looking at the same thing very soon now. That has significant implications for the planet, I would think. Two final slides. 
So, just in general, keep these things in mind as you're doing your business. As energy prices rise, and two things are going to drive up energy prices, the underlying emerging scarcity of conventional oil that I've talked about, and then carbon pricing, which will be implanted sooner or later. These are two independent reasons that energy prices will rise. People, energy, people materials, and products will travel less. Production is going to come closer to consumption. Uh, and, uh, and so there will be less trade in the world, especially of stuff that's heavy. Things that are heavy will tend to be made closer to where they're going to be consumed because the energy costs of moving the stuff around are going to be really significant. So energy pricing alone is going to start to move us towards a system that decouples a little bit, where you've got loosening, couple, loosened coupling and perhaps more resilience. The populations are going to concentrate in small but dense communities with ready access to agricultural land. Uh, the access to agricultural land is going to turn out to be a very important thing in the future. We are, in, we are starting to see the leading edge of a global food crisis that's going to probably go on for many decades. And, uh, and, and those areas of the world that have agricultural land close by are going to be uh, significantly advantaged compared to others. And then finally, the implications is the cost differential between locally produced goods and those produced far away will decline and may even reverse because the advantage of cheap labor in China or Bangladesh or something will ultimately be outweighed by the extra cost of the energy to move stuff back and forth between North America and China and Bangladesh. Stores are going to be smaller, embedded in communities and within walking or biking distance. And the work is going to be more, more diverse in these communities uh, because they're going to have to supply a larger fraction of all their needs. Now that is what I have to say today. I hope I stimulated a few ideas and comments and questions. I hope we have a little bit of time. How much time do we have for about 10 minutes for questions or so before you? Microphone, thank you. Uh, before you uh, start your, your drinking, your wine and cheese. <laughs> Uh, but I am interested in hearing your comments, and, uh, and I just want to emphasize that uh, th th what you're engaged in professionally is one of the most important professions in uh, laying down the strategies that we're going to use as societies for coping with these staggering stresses over coming decades. Uh, I really hope you start to make the right decisions, because we're living with the consequences of a lot of bad decisions previous planning decisions, and the stakes are now extremely high to try to get this right, especially since we don't know exactly what's going to happen in the future. But to the extent that you can look at that list of principles of resilience that I laid down before, uh, decentralization, diversity, loosening coupling, and the like, if you can build those into your thinking about planning, then I think ultimately we'll all be a lot better off. Thank you very much.